Good morning, everybody. Today is Sunday, actually. Um, the 9th? No, the 8th. Today is the 8th of January. And I hope everybody's doing well. The house is quiet. I have it for a few more minutes. Cheryl is doing well. She's resting. But I wanted to make sure I got our lesson in. Yesterday, it was kind of not a day. So, anyway, we are going to be back in First Thessalonians. Pick up with our verse-by-verse um, study. So if you haven't already prayed, please pause the video, pray, lift it up, and we will be in verse 15. First Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 15. We were moving on, right? Now remember, we got to remember this is in context of Paul's encouraging the church at Thessalonica, and this is this passage of scripture 12 through 15 is how to have a healthy church and, um, you know, praying and encouraging your leaders, um, not just your pastor, but your leaders of the church, which would be our deacons and your Sunday school teachers, a whole lot of people that are over us, right, that are all involved in caring for our spiritual growth and wellness, right? And then it talks about how we as the believers in the church, what we can do to help encourage and be a part of a healthy church. So this is the last part of this little passage here, verse 15. And um, I'm going to read the passage. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. Now, remember, in this passage, it is speaking to believers about other believers in the church. And we have had, um, we've talked about um, wayward sheep amongst the flock that are those that just don't know any better and need some encouragement and admonishment on what it means to be a, maybe to be a good church member or just a believer and how to make a walk that's worthy. Um, so we have that. And then we had the worried uh, sheep that tend to um, not have any confidence in themselves and worry about, you know, where they are in Christ or maybe their part in the body. Those are, are people we want to encourage and um, encourage them in their faith and in their growth and who they are in Christ. Um, the weak believers, weak believers can be those that are struggling with their walk because of the past. When we get saved, we come out and we want to um, not go back. Um, maybe it's uh, issues in their life, areas that um, they're, they struggle with because of past sins or current sins that they need to be protected or encouraged on how to make a stand and make a change. Um, whether it's alcoholics to gossips. I mean, it doesn't matter. We're all struggling with one thing or another. So we're to help those that are weak and uphold them in their faith. Um, also the wearisome. We talked about that before the new year. Those that just like suck the life out of you. Sometimes they're very distressful to be around sometimes, but they're part of the body of Christ and they need to be loved and, you know, put up with, or somebody's putting up with us, right? <laughs> so the last of these sheep in the body, the different types of, of people that we meet, all sorts of people in the church, whether we knew them not before or, or we've always known them, but people that we need to work with and get along with in the body will be the, um, those that are, did you see this? Render evil for evil. What? Believers don't do evil. Do you sin? We all do. We're all sinners saved by grace, stuck in this flesh until the day that we're either raptured, oh, come Lord Jesus, or we die and see the Lord on the other side. So until that day, we still deal with our sinful flesh. None of us are perfect. None of us have completely reached that place. You may think you know people that are, oh, they're just so like Christ, but they would probably be the first to tell you that they have struggles and they're not where they want to be in their walk of faith. But we all have things that we do and we all can sin. And 
there are many that have left the church because of being hurt by others in the church. Now, let me say that, you know, any of us who've been in church for a long period of time, I am going to lay odds that you, if you've been in church for any length of time, especially for years, you've experienced hurtful things. This is what happens. Um, it's not a reason to leave a church. Now, there are some things that are more even wicked than others that believers that are truly saved have done. Um, you expect to be mocked and things to happen from those on the outside, right? But when it happens on the inside, in your church, in your circle of friends, oh wait, in your family, that betrayal or hurt is so much deeper than if it was people you didn't even care about. People on the outside, the lost world, you just don't care. Somebody calls you a terrible name or is mean to you or treats you badly and they're not believers and they're not somebody you live with or spend a lot of time with. It can be hurtful, but you know, you just shrug it off and you hope you never see them again. But when it's those that you do spend a lot of time with, or you live within your home, or hello, you have Sunday dinners together, um, those kind of things, that becomes a more difficult situation. Hopefully, but I would lay odds that all of us at some point in time have been hurtful, maybe even done wicked things, as believers to others. It's a sad situation. It really is. Hopefully we haven't, but I'm going to lay odds because we're sinners, we probably have, even if it's unintentional. Although, in circles of women, I have been a witness to a many a thing. And gossip, hello, gossip is an evil, wicked thing to be a part of. And there's a lot of gossiping. Over the years, have you, have you, you've never been a part of a gossip circle? You've never shared something you didn't know for sure was the right thing or verified or and let alone why does it need to be shared of somebody's personal stuff? There are lots of things and ways. Um, hopefully we've never done it. But yet it says here, see that none render evil for evil. Well, wait a minute. What are the types of things that could be evil? I've just listed some, right? And um, some of those things can be just... Attacking somebody with your words. Uh, maybe it's bad-mouthing somebody to the pastor or to other people because you don't like them. They're, guess what? In the church, there are going to be people you don't like. Although, we're called to love one another in the body, right? As we grow in Christ, you find that there are people that just absolutely annoy you in church. Have you had any of those? I've had many over the years. Learning to love them that's where the Lord works on us, right? And um, whether you've been in ministry work or just the, you know, ladies working in the kitchen or whatever it is that we're doing, there are always going to be these kind of people that you don't always like. And sometimes those that don't like you, maybe you don't even understand why they don't like you, but sometimes people do things and these are the types of things sinning against one another. And um, maybe that's where things have happened, but Lying, gossip, um, ostracizing, you know, like purposely blocking somebody from being on a committee or with you with a group of people doing, you don't, you just choose not to call them to be a part of the group because you'd rather just stay with your little group. Or maybe you've been blacklisted out or blocked out from being a part of the group. You know, in the body of Christ, anything, always have said that with women's ministry, the more we can bring people in to be a part of it, the more women want to be a part of that group. Unfortunately, we women especially, but people on a whole tend to be clicky. I know we tried at Sooner, we have this Bible Bits and Fellowship thing, and we're all, we were all originally told that we're not supposed to sit with our regular group, try to get to know people. Well, over the years, they've stopped saying, oh, sit with people you don't know. It just turns into a, everybody sits, there's even tables that seem to be specifically assigned, but they're not, but that's where people sit. Always with the same people, always with the, you know, and we'll have people that are visiting 
or new to the church don't know anybody that will be sitting by themselves eating when the whole gist of our so-called Bible Bits of Fellowship was supposed to be getting to know one another and fellowshipping together. So <laughs> I know there are a couple of us that have really tried, especially if we see somebody sitting on their own, either to bring them back to our table. But a lot of times, I mean, we've sat down and people have, who have left their stuff have noticed that we're sitting there and they will move their stuff somewhere else. It's like, do I take offense? I don't know. It just is that, that way of clicking. And, you know, it can be a very hurtful thing. Um, and these are the type of things that are sinful. And when they're purposely done, and you know, as well as I know, I mean, you outright see disdain and dripping meanness sometimes. Seen it. It's a sad thing. And the Lord will deal with it sooner or later. Now, when people realize what they're doing and they fix it and apologize, praise the Lord. But hopefully you are not going to be a part of that. Um, you know, one of the worst things that is sinful and wicked amongst believers is when you see marriages that are pulled apart. Of course, you have to really wonder what's going on with the individuals. But do you know of any that have been married and in the church and they're divorced because of adultery happening within the church. I've known, I especially think of this one woman that I worked with at First Southern whose husband was a deacon and took up with the wife of somebody else in the church. She worked on staff. I think she was, I don't, I wasn't there, but um, they hooked up. Two marriages were totally destroyed and they had the audacity, no church discipline done to him whatsoever as a deacon, nothing done to her. They chose to come back to the church and nothing was said, they were allowed. And here was this poor woman who was wronged after many years of marriage, all her children were grown. And then he's allowed to come back and people are laughing with the guy and talking with him, like everything is fine. Yet what he did was absolute sin and wicked and never should have been embraced back in their sin, the destruction that happened. And she was very bitter all the way to the days of her end of her life. And when I first met her, I couldn't understand such an angry, bitter woman. She scared me. And then when I heard the story, no wonder she became angry and bitter. But she chose to stay in the very church where everything happened because her friends were there and where nobody did anything and welcomed back the sinner with his adulterous woman and those families. It was wicked all the way around from the church leadership that didn't do anything to what those people did to their families. This is wickedness done in the name of believers. Now as to whether those that man and woman who did all that they did were ever redeemed, that's between them and the Lord. I would lay odds, no. But we are all sinners saved by grace and people have fallen and made bad choices. Hopefully, if you're redeemed and you're walking in faith, you're not going to make those choices, but people have fallen. So this kind of thing happens in the church. So when we see this here, see that none render evil for evil. This passage makes the, I mean, it's just assumed, not assumed, Paul knows in even just the year, early years of the church that sinners are sinners. And this is all stuff that you deal with, whether they're people that can't seem to get control of um, their fear and anxiety or um, they're annoying or whatever all these things are. All people in the church are going to get all sorts and we all belong to Christ. We all have to work with one another, be with one another. And so the passages talk about what you do with them, right? We encourage, we uplift, all this. Well, what do you do about the wicked? Well, first off, Matthew 18. And um, you can turn there real quick. This passage is not about prayer. Remember, never twist it and never ever again, quote, wherever two or more are gathered in my name, I am there in the midst. That is twisted scripture. And um, we do not misuse scripture or twist it to make it mean what we want it to mean. But Matthew 18, and in Matthew 18, the passages, sorry, I'm looking for my reference here. We're going to read 21 to 22. Wait, Matthew 18, where am I? 
15 is where we're at, 15. And it talks about, moreover, for brothers shall trespass against thee, go and tell him. We are to deal with somebody who's hurt us and who's harmed us, who's done wrong to us, first one-on-one, -on -one, right? So you're aware of this, right? Go and tell him. And uh, between the two of thee, him alone, and if he shall not hear thee, thou hast gained. If he hears you, you've gained your brother. You reconcile. Everything is about seeking res reconciliation when you see fallen people that are sinning, doing wicked things in the church. 16, but if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word may be established. So you have witnesses. You're going to try to work this out. You are making an effort with the person who has wronged you. Since they haven't come to you to apologize, you're trying to work it out. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it to the church. But if he shall neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. So there, there is a place when you're dealing with sin and wickedness, like in that situation with that uh, lady that I knew um, on staff all those years ago, that it, if the church had done what scripture calls for to be done in situations, which was adultery, destroying of two marriages, maybe both would have uh, repented and gone back to their marriages and reconciled and brought total peace between the church and these people and the marriages. But that never happened. And what happened afterwards was just sheer carnage that never got healed over. But there is there is something in place. So if there are people doing wickedness in the church, you seek out them to be reconciled, to, you know, bring repentance, or you go to the church and you allow the church to deal with it. And hopefully the pastor and the elders of the church, the deacons and them will work with that and help to bring restoration or end the evilness that's happening within, right? But this passage is that there is recourse for this kind of thing happening, right? So, um, but this here, this passage, doesn't even touch on, because Paul, he likes to deal with those people and deal with, you know, things that are happening that are bad in the church. But this passage isn't dealing with that here. What is it dealing with? It's dealing with the believers that are in the church that have been wronged. This passage, see that none render evil for evil. We get that there's going to be things that are said, gossip, hateful attacks, things that are done in a church. To be a healthy church, remember the context is all of the believers doing things that help keep a church healthy. The thing to do, there's going to be these people. There's going to be things that are done that are wrong. They're going to be goats in the church that are not believers that are going to wrong you or wrong your children or wrong the pastor. There's going to be things that happen. But what do we as a body, as individuals, how do we deal with this? We're going to leave church discipline to the pastor and the elders and that. Here, this is where it relates to us. See that none render evil for evil. Now, in the Old Testament, you'd see the thing where an eye for an eye, but that is not what Jesus in the church for believers and the redeemed to do. It is, isn't. This is dealing with us as believers making choices and deal. it's our response, right? The instruction is not to render evil for evil. And wait, wait. To any man, unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, both among yourselves and to all men. So this isn't just for in the church. This, he also touched, and remember the Thessalonians were being persecuted. People were being 
losing their jobs, all the different things that back in the day would have been allowed and acceptable, especially in a pagan Roman world that would have been perfectly acceptable to take away a man's livelihood because he isn't going to go and worship at the pagan place that all the electricians go to. There were, was no electrician. <laughs> But, you know, the pottery workers. Um, and that was perfectly normal and acceptable. So not only within the church, but also, Paul's saying, outside of the church, anybody that wrongs you, do not render evil for evil. Wow. Oh, guess what that covers, too? Your family. Maybe your family's in the church, but even so, it also covers your family. And that is really tough to deal with because we know families can practically eat their young. I mean, the stuff that happens in families, I've seen it amongst my children. I've witnessed it around my family's relatives, my dad's and my mom's extended family. Um, I've seen it in other people's families. I've seen it in my husband's family. Families can be messy. And Paul is encompassing everybody. So for those of us... Now we're just going to talk about for when we've been wronged. When you're wrong, render not evil for evil. Oh my goodness. Let's go to Romans chapter 12. Romans, of course, Paul's written Romans. I believe Paul's written Romans. Chapter 12, we're going to read verses 20, 19 to 21. 19. This is Romans chapter 12, 19 to 21. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. Hmm. But give place unto wrath. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirsts, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with good. You've heard that passage before. It also comes from Proverbs 25. But so now we have this response that we saw in 1 Thessalonians of um, do not render evil for evil. I'm making my way back there. Um, evil for evil. We, in Romans chapter 12, are not to avenge ourselves. You laugh, if it happens, you don't turn around and immediately get ready to punch the socket lights out of them, right? We're not to do that. You give place to wrath. Fine, let it come. The Lord's going to avenge me. Now, that is not with our flesh. Our flesh wants to leap back. Somebody tells me somebody has done them wrong, going, let me get a couple other girls. We'll go over and we'll hold them for you while you beat them up. That's my flesh. And many of you have witnessed and heard me say that. That is the first response within my flesh that comes up. Let's go take care of them. You hurt my kid, I'm going to be the mama bear to chew you up. That's our response, right? Our flesh. Scripture deals with it differently. So we're not to avenge ourselves. That is so very, very important. The more angry you are, the harder it is to see through the green and the anger, the red, the rising up. You have to step back and take a breath and remind yourself that the Lord is there. In Psalm 51, remind yourselves over and over, against thee only have I sinned, Lord. That was in relation to murdering Uriah. And David says, against thee only have I sinned. Remember, anybody does wrong to you or me, they're wronging the Lord. And when we do wrong to somebody, we have harmed the Lord. We are, it's against the Lord that we hurt. So it's very important. Those go together. That's why we are not to do this, right? Be kind to your enemy. <laughs> now, you don't just go, I'm going to be kind to him just so that I kill him with kindness. And he, it's reeking coals upon his head. Now, in our heart of hearts, we should not be designed, well, I'll get him one way or another. I'll, Lord, I'll let you take care of him. I'm going to be kind to him just to get him back. That kind of misses the point. <laughs> but yet, it is like keeping coals because, especially the lost, well, anybody, why are you being nice to me? Uh, do you have every reason not to be nice to me? That has broken down walls. 
and remove scales from so many lost people, so many people that did not know what to do when others have forgiven them when they've done horrible things. People have gotten saved in jail when they've murdered somebody and the family of the murdered person comes and offers them forgiveness and prays for them. Hear testimony and testimony and testimony of that. Why are you acting that way? Because this is what the Lord requires of us. What? They don't understand because this is not the way of our flesh. This is the way of the spirit. When you choose the way of the spirit, the Lord will bless you greatly and those around you, even those you forgive. Isn't that amazing? Um, also, do not be overcome by evil, but you overcome evil with good. Now, it can be very disturbing, depressing, difficult, hard to deal with, um, fearful, things that may happen to you, yet we're not to be overcome by the evil. That's where trusting the Lord and reading his word and resting in his, his promises come even when things are done to us that are bad. You can overcome evil with good, but you can also withstand whatever evil happens to you. Even if for a night you may be in tears and sadness, it's just like when you lose somebody, you're going to sorrow, but you're not to sorrow without hope. We always have hope because we're the redeemed. That's the difference, right? So when we have this, we're not to render. Your first response may be to, but we're not to render evil to evil. What are we to do? But ever follow that which is good. We are to render, if you want to say, good. Those who do us wrong in church, those who treat you badly, who maybe they've told people things that aren't true or half truths. You know, you can try to go and defend yourself all you want, which most of the time doesn't look good. Um, God makes a way. If you've been blocked from ministry or from a, something that you wanted to be a part of and all that, you can overlook it. There's nothing worth anger and bitterness to make you lose your joy in being in church, lose your joy for being a believer. None of it's worth it. This, it, it's all comes down to doing what is right. What choosing love, we're to love one another. That's how the whole world is supposed to see us as loving one another. But when our first response is rendering evil, it's getting back, and that's anger and bitterness. That is not love, right? It's all about love. In the local body, it's loving one another, even when they don't deserve it. Oh, wait a minute. Is that like, you know, what God does for us? Yes, it is. And that's what he expects of us, right? It's always choosing love. Trouble will come. There will be people that will do wrong things. There will be people that you admire, that you think are so wonderful, that will make bad choices. Haven't we done it? I know I have. How about you? We have that happen. But we need to seek to love despite it, right? Matthew 18, where we read about the... Um, in. Uh, the church discipline, go back to Matthew 18. Matthew, Matthew, Matthew. I should have it always marked. Steve's so good, he marks and tags. I don't, that's never good, right? So after all this talk that Jesus has given in Matthew, in verses 15, all the way down to 20, where he's saying, you know, whatever you decide as a church in the discipline and how you forgive or, or you know, that whole context, not prayer, um, for, for wherever two or three are gathered in my name, there am I in the midst. All that relates to church discipline, not prayer. Then in the very next two verses, it says in verse 21, then came Peter, always Peter, right? To him and said, Lord, how, how oft shall my brother sin against me? And I forgive him. Till seven times, Jesus saith unto him, I say not unto thee, 
until seven times, but until 70 times seven. Now we've all heard that. We've had it taught to us in Sunday school. Maybe we've taught the Sunday school class. We've heard the preaching. All this relates to the fact that forgiveness is never limited. It's never a, you know, my husband, Every single time for 40 years, he does this. This is what he does. I'm done. I'm not forgiving again. 70 times 7. That's always. Isn't that what the Lord does for us? Oh, wait. He's forgiven us at the cross. And he's made it as far from the east as from the west is how far he's put our sin away from us. The sin from before, today, and tomorrow. All Put away. They describe it going between the shoulders, his shoulder blades. You can't reach between your shoulder blades. That's what it means. And here we are dealing with people within the church. And yes, the context also, Paul says, oh, and by the way, for all those out of the church. But here we are in the midst of family, church, and outside. And we are are to do good unto those who do wickedness to us. Just like forgiving. Oh yeah, do you have to wait till they ask for forgiveness? No, we give it anyway. 70 times seven. That forgiveness is all wrapped up in that love that the Lord did for us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were sinners, while those in your family or those in the church are doing the wickedness or the sinful things or saying the awful things, whatever it is, Christ died for us. We're to choose love. Choosing love makes all the difference in the world. Even if relationships are broken, if you are not the guilty one and you have responded in love, the Lord will bless you and honor you for that. This is what leads to a healthy church. Even though there are going to be lost people in a healthy church, there are going to be those that are, remember, weak in their faith, that are worried, that are all these different things, even that will sin in the church. But if we respond with love and forgiveness, our part, love and forgiveness, every, it, starts to, it starts to happen with other people. Doesn't it? Haven't we seen this? Yes, we have. And so I want to encourage you as you take apart scripture, passage by passage, ponder upon it. This whole passage we've taken weeks in our study to go through and take apart in First Thessalonians, that you look at it. Go back over. Maybe you've made notes, you know, like in a journal or, you know, something. <laughs> But ask the Lord, first off, are you one who is one of these sheep? If so, ask the Lord to bring those along to help you. Ask the Holy Spirit to be the one to help you not be that way anymore or to get stronger, however that is. If you realize that you've been a part to doing something wrong to another in the church, go to those people and, and ask for forgiveness and get reconciled and make it better. You know, that's what we do in love. We not only offer forgiveness, but we will seek forgiveness. You know, some of us are just too proud. We figure, well, I just won't act that way anymore and I'll be really nice to them and they'll just, they'll just, it'll just go over the back and I don't have to worry about it. Don't do that. If you've wronged somebody, if you've said something, if you think you've hurt their feelings, go and ask for forgiveness. The more we ask for forgiveness and seek forgiveness from others around, they will be doing the same. I mean, as a parent, I have to say, asking for forgiveness wasn't always something that I did. I wish I'd done more often. I tried. Um, but those who are forgiving and seek forgiveness, people are going to give it. If they don't, you've, you've tried. And you leave it to the Lord. But it builds stronger ties, stronger relationships. That's what we're supposed to be doing. So I hope that this has been something that has helped you that you are seeing in the scripture for yourself. I hope that you are weekly and daily, what do I mean weekly? Daily, you're in the word. I know on Facebook, quite a few of you have shared with what you're doing, and I know some of you are doing your, your reading through the Bible in a year. I encourage you, turn off the TV, 
Turn off the radio. Don't play games on your phone or computer. Get to that and read your scripture and try to stay up. I think it's a good thing for everybody to at least done it once, to make it all the way through the Bible in a year. Um, it's a very good thing. Faithfully be in the Word. No matter where it's at, faithfully go to the Word. The Holy Spirit will bless you, and it will help you to grow and be more and more like Christ. And I hope that this is good for you today. I pray for you. You know I'm here, even if I'm not in Oklahoma. I'm here for you. Just give a call. Text me. I'll, be, I'll respond as quick as I can. I love you all. Have a wonderful weekend. Bye-bye.